Hello and welcome back to Introduction to General Relativity. In today's lecture, we're going to continue our discussion of derivative operators on manifolds and parallel transport. So suppose that we have a manifold M and a derivative operator uh, delta. So delta A is a derivative operator in the sense of the previous lecture. So suppose we have such a setup. Then today I'm going to explain to you how to use a delta a derivative or a delta operator to build a notion of a parallel a notion of parallel transporter or equivalently a parallel transporter device that will allow us to identify tangent spaces at different points on the manifold. So here's my cartoon for a manifold. Here's M. Here's a point P. And here's a point Q. Now, suppose we have some vector at P in the tangent space. So this, there's this vector VA in the tangent space at the point at the manifold at the point P and suppose we have some curve some sufficiently nice curve joining P and another point Q then our goal today is to define the notion via delta A this derivative operator of a parallel transport operation so we want to design or construct or engineer a box U delta what does u delta do? It takes a vector at the tangent space at p and it produces somehow a vector at the tangent space at q. And uh, how are we going to design this box given the data of this derivative operator delta a? Suppose that that's at the moment just given to us. Well, via the following definition. So let C be a curve. Okay, I called it gamma. Um, let's call the curve C. Just realize it probably makes better if we call it C here. Yep, let C be a curve in the manifold M. So this is the manifold M with a tangent vector TA. So Several lectures ago, I introduced the notion of a tangent vector to a curve. So given the data of a curve, you can always define a tangent vector. There it is there, I've drawn it in red, that's TA. So you've got to, the, so far the input data is just a curve, C, and from the curve you get automatically a tangent vector, TA. Now a vector, another vector, has nothing to do with TA a priori, VA, given at each point in the curve C. So we're not demanding that VA is existing everywhere. We don't demand that VA is a vector field. We just demand that we have a vector at every point in the curve C, this one dimensional submanifold C. So a, a vector VA given at each point in C is said to be, and here comes the definition, parallelly transported along C if when you construct the following tensor, it's always zero. So that's our definition of what it means for a vector VA to be parallelly transported along a curve. A bit awkward to say it, but that's the definition. Uh, oh yeah, for all points in the curve C. So let's just pause for a moment to investigate this definition. We have a curve, drawn the curve there. We have a vector V all the way along the curve. So VA is defined all the way along the curve. There it is there. And 
it's not necessarily defined anywhere else. We don't have to define VA on any other point of the manifold. It's only required to be defined on the curve and it could be just nothing else outside the curve. Now a vector VA given at each point in the C, it's said to be parallelly transported along C if when you take the derivative in the direction of the tangent vector TA of the curve of the vector V, you always get zero, meaning that the the vector doesn't change as you push it along the curve. That's the picture you're meant to have in mind. Now, uh, we can immediately generalize this to, to all tensor fields, uh, not tensor fields, but tensors defined on the curve. So similarly, so if you have a tensor now on the curve in abstract index notation, So if you have a tensor along C, uh, then we call it, we say that the tensor is parallelly transported along C if, well, the natural generalization of the condition for vectors is just to do the same derivative, directional derivative along the curve and demand that it's equal to zero. And that these this definition constitutes our notion of parallel transport on a manifold. So in the case where um, the derivative operator is given by some coordinate derivative, we can express the parallel transport definition in a coordinate chart. So in particular, the coordinate chart defining So if you go to the coordinate chart that defines delta A, and then you write out this first parallel transport condition in components, then what do you get? Well, the tangent vector to the curve is just the derivative of the, of the coordinates of the curve with respect to the parameter specifying where you're along the curve. The, uh, the derivative operator is the derivative operator. And then uh, we have the uh, affine connection, but in the coordinate chart, these gamma equation, uh, uh, coefficients. And then if we look at this first term here, so this is the bit corresponding to TA. And the second bit's the bit corresponding to uh, delta A. And the final part of the equation is the part of the depending on the C coefficients. So if we know if we just put these two terms together, we know that we just have the the derivative of the uh, vector components with respect to T. So if you just look at the green and the yellow highlighted terms, you see that we can put them together. And we end up with the following equation. We just, it's just the same as doing the derivative of the vector components v nu in this basis with respect to t, the parameter specifying where you are on the curve. And the same goes for the second part of the equation as well. So we have in components, the, this, this equation here, which determines how a vector is parallel transported along a curve C, but now in a coordinate basis, in particular the coordinate basis defining the manifold, uh, defining the derivative operator delta. I just want to emphasize that parallel transport, this notion that we just introduced here, only depends on VA on the curve C. We don't need that VA is a vector field.
So this is a set of equations um, in a coordinate chart. This yellow box star is actually a set of equations. It's a set of non-linear ordinary differential equations. And we can ask, when does a solution exist? Is the solution unique? And so on. Um, and the answer is, it's, uh, it's guaranteed at least for a, an interval of, of time t, or parameter t. And that, that comes from general existence and uniqueness results in the theory of ordinary differential equations. So if you're just happy to believe, that's a, I mean, that's a whole course by itself, use it. Theory of ordinary differential, non-linear ordinary differential equations. Uh, and I'll just, I assume that you'll be happy to believe me that there's a solution is guaranteed to exist. So exist, standard existence and uniqueness results, you can look in the book of Coddington and Levinson, for example, uh, to, to convince yourself of this. Uh, guarantee that there's a solution of star four. And here is a very interesting observation. A given initial VA. So what we've uh, what that already tells us, this, this little bit of information that there's an, a solution to this equation for a given initial point is that once you've specified the vector VA at the beginning of the curve that you want to parallel transport it along, you've actually determined VA entirely a length along the curve. So it's not an arbitrary VA that is defined, uh, arbitrary vector that's defined along the curve. It's actually completely determined by the, the starting point. So given uh, two points P and Q in the manifold uh, and a curve gamma connecting them, uh, I'm going to use C and gamma for, to notate curves. Um, we, uh, we can immediately infer from the, the fact that there's a, a, there exists a, a solution and the, the solution is unique to equation star, we can immediately use that to build um, the following parallel transporter. We actually have now determined a parallel transporter. U gamma. And such a parallel transporter U gamma is also known as a connection. So the way it works is we, we, okay, I'll draw another picture. Here's a manifold M. Here are two points. P is another point. Q, here's a curve U gamma given in the manifold. So note that the parallelization of parallel transport depends on the curve. Here's a vector, an initial vector VA at the point P. Now let's look at everything in a chart psi, namely the chart defining the partial derivative, uh, the, the coordinate derivative operator delta A. Here's two points, P and Q, connected by a curve gamma. Now, now we're in the coordinate system. Uh, here's the vector VP. And we define the vector VP to, or the vector V mu now in this coordinate system to be parallel transported along U gamma if it obeys this equation star. So not just any vector is allowed to be, not just any vector along the, the curve gamma is defined to be parallel transported, namely only once solving uh, the equation star. So given a vector, an initial vector v mu at the point p, we, we get a parallel transported vector v twiddle at p 
point uh, Q. And we could just simply say that U, that that's defining the parallel transport of V, v at the point P. So that's the picture you should have in mind when talking about parallel transport. So given just the structure of a manifold, there's actually no preferred derivative operator. We'll, we'll, we'll take consider an example in, presently and uh, that'll illustrate that I hope. Uh, so there's, there's no real way around that. Um, we just don't have enough data to completely specify a unique derivative operator. The only way to uh, proceed to satisfy ourselves that there is a scenario where there can be a unique derivative operator or preferred derivative operator is if we give in some additional data and the additional data that we need to supply is that of a metric. So if we have the data of a metric GAB, we can make a canonical choice um, of derivative operator delta A. And wh why can we do that? Well, there's some addition, we got additional data now. So the metric supplies us amongst other things with the notion of length. So a metric also supplies us with a notion of an inner product between two tangent vectors V and W at the point P. And indeed the inner product determines the length notion. Now, what we can demand is that as we parallel transport one vector along a curve, we can demand that its length stays the same, right? That's, that's what's one thing that should really be correct, right? It, you, what kind of notion of parallel transport would it be if as we push it along the curve, the, the, the tangent vector is getting shorter and longer? Uh, that gets us some of the way towards determining a unique a preferred or canonical choice of derivative operator. But the additional data that we should really exploit to just settle this is to demand also the inner products between two tangent vectors are preserved as you push them along a uh, parallel transport them along a curve. After all, if you're somehow moving vectors parallel to, themsel uh, parallel to themselves along a curve, it shouldn't be that you're changing the angles between them as you're moving along the curve. Here's the picture, so here's M. We have a point P, we have a point Q, we have a curve connecting them. And now we're talking about a scenario where we've got two vectors at the point P, V, P and W, V and W, let's see, V and W. Now you would want, right, as you parallel transport along this curve that these two vectors have the same angle between them at each point on the curve. and so on, right? All along the curve. And that, that turns out requiring that the inner product or the angle between arbitrary pairs of vectors in the tangent, tangent space, re requiring that this inner product is preserved uh, during parallel transport, that's enough to determine a unique or canonical choice of derivative operator. Okay, how does that work? Well, we, we demand that the inner product doesn't change as we go along the, the curve. So as we parallel transport along the curve. So 
The notion of parallel transport even works for scalar functions, right? GBC, VB, WC is a scalar function on M. It's a nice smooth function on M. And the notion of parallel transport is defined for all tensors, and it's just and we just demand that that scalar function doesn't change along the curve. So we take two vectors uh, v a w a in the tangent space of P. We compute the inner product. We parallel transport them, and then we demand that the inner product between the parallel transported versions doesn't change. So. Um, Implicit here in this equation is that each of these two vectors is parallel transported as well, right? You know, if we don't parallel transport V and W along the curve, then we shouldn't demand that their inner products uh, are invariant. But suppose we have parallel transported V and W along the curve, then the inner products ought to be the same, right? Along the whole curve or not to change. And now if you look at that expression here, for the, the change along the curve of the inner product, we can actually start using the rules of derivative operators to compute this expression. So we're going to use the Leibniz property. To, to expand out this, this condition here. So we apply the derivative operator to the first term in that expression, uh, which is the metric G, B, C, and we leave V, B, and W, C alone. Then we have to apply the derivative operator to the second term, which is uh, V, B, but then we leave W, C alone. And then we apply the derivative operator to the third term while leaving G, B, C, and V, B alone. But by assumption, right, these two, two vectors are parallel transported along the curve. So those two terms vanish. So this condition that the, of the vanishing of this inner product uh, means that uh, we are requiring that VC, WC, TA, Delta A, G, B, C equals zero. Um, we demand that this condition is true for all parallel transported Vs, for all para oops, that should be a B, shouldn't it? For all parallel transported V vector fields V, for all parallel transported vector fields W, and for all curves, right, joining um, these two points, and hence for all tangent vectors to the curves. Now, the only way that can all be true is if separately delta A G B C is zero. And uh, that's an extra condition that, that the derivative operator has to satisfy. So we derived a condition on the metric, sorry, on the, the derivative operator delta A in terms of the metric. So if you think that the metric is additional data on a manifold, uh, then, and that there's this whole family of possible metrics that you could put on a manifold, then you can see that there could be, and it actually is, an incompatibility between an arbitrary derivative operator delta A and an arbitrary metric GBC. They, the choice of derivative operator, so it's really, you've got to think that the derivative operator here, delta A, uh, it, you know, there's a, a family of delta A's um, which are constrained by uh, this choice of a metric G, B, C. So not even though there's an infinite number of derivative operators you can assign to a manifold or associate to a manifold M, not everyone is going to be allowed because they might end up not obeying this condition here, this delta A G B C condition, this or equation star star. And now we're going to ask the question, well, 
what constraints does this equation place on the choice of derivative operator delta a? Remember, once you've got a derivative operator delta a, you can get another one just in terms of a tensor field of type 2, 1, uh, sorry, 1, 2. And so you, you might think, well, maybe, maybe the, you, there's still a plenty of choice of derivative operator. Uh, and the answer, of course, is not. Um, and it's even sort of surprising how little choice you actually have. So suppose we've got a manifold and we've got a, a metric G A B, then the following theorem tells us that not only is there not much choice in derivative operator that you can assign to a manifold, in fact, there's essentially a unique derivative operator. That you can assign to your manifold, then there exists a unique derivative operator delta a satisfying star star which is otherwise written as g delta a g b c equals zero and it's kind of amazing right you, you know the, the the data of a metric is just enough to uniquely specify one derivative operator it doesn't over specify like you know star star could be too constraining right it could throw out all the derivative operators that are possible it could be under constraining no it's just right Equation star star is just right for choosing a derivative operator. So let's, this, this theorem is actually relatively easy to prove. Uh, it's an explicit computation and you get the, uh, an explicit formula for the derivative operator that satisfies this equation star star. So suppose delta a twiddle is a derivative operator Um, and you know, the example that will occupy us is, is delta a, uh, is the coordinate derivative delta a. And then we impose star star. And what does it say? Well, it says that zero is delta a g b c, uh, and that since that we are applying the derivative operator to a tensor of type zero two, we have to use the definition of the action of delta A on tensors. And when we do, we, re we see that delta A applied to GBC is the same as delta A twiddle applied to GBC minus, and now we have this, these C coefficients here uh, that we have to apply to each index separately of the tensor G. And uh, Let's process that expression. So the thing on the left is zero is going to be equal to the thing on the right. Now, um, let's take a look at the equation on the right. And we're going to process this equation in various ways. And then we're going to determine a condition on the C's. Well, let's write out the equation on the right hand side first. The equation on the right hand side, rearranging things, simply says that delta A twiddle GBC equals CCAB plus C, B, A, C, right? Because we've got the metric, remember we're raising and lowering here. I'm just using the fact that when you contract, oops, when you contract the metric against the tensor, that's the equivalent to lowering an index of the tensor. That's in this abstract index notation is how we represent it. And that's how we define the action. So we can write the right hand side of that equation there, rearrange things as just this equation here, delta A twiddle GBC equals C C A B plus big C B A C. Now, this this equation, okay, it's very fine. It's, that's, a, that's an equation. We're gonna derive two further equations. They're exactly the same equation. I'm just using different indices here. I'm gonna relabel indices. So, in, to get to the second line, I've replaced A with B, and uh, B goes to A, right? So every instance of B in the previous equations have been replaced with A and vice versa. And there's actually a third equation we can write out and write more out, but we're only going to write out these three. These are just derived, right? There's no magic here. It's the same equation, just with different ind index labelings. So in this second equation, second derived equation or third equation written down here, C has been replaced with B, 
B has been replaced with A, and A goes to C. And now we've got three equations. They're all true, they're all just the same equation, but written out in different ways. And so what we're gonna do is add this one and subtract the second one, the third one. So we're gonna take these three equations, add the first two, and then subtract from the, that sum the third one. Well, let's write it out, what do we get? So we get delta A twiddle G B C plus delta B twiddle G A C minus delta C twiddle G A B has got to equal the right hand side, right? Summed and subtracted. So we've got C C A B plus C B A C plus C C B A plus C A B C minus C B C A minus C A C B. So the right hand side has got six terms. But now let's look at that and you know, we, we did these index substitutions for a reason. And the reason is, is that there's gonna be some cancellations and here they are, right? Here's our first cancellation. These two terms cancel out. And also the A, C, B terms cancel out. At least they should do, I haven't made a mistake. Ah oh, yeah, A, B, C and A, C, B cancel out. And the reason these cancel out is that they remember the coefficients tensor C uh, is symmetric in the, the, the last two indices. So C, B, A, B, C equals C, A, C, B. Right, symmetric, prove that. Uh, and so these two terms cancel out as well. And so we're actually left with the following equation. And then using the fact that these things are symmetric, we, we can add these two terms together. So we get two C, C, A, B on the right hand side. We're almost there because remember the freedom here, the freedom we have is in the choice of these C coefficients. That's the freedom we have in redefining t uh, derivative operators. And we see that that's already determined by the metric, right, on the left hand side. And we just want to make that, express that a bit more precisely, uh, concretely. So we contract both sides of this equation with the inverse of the metric now, and we divide by two. And then we're gonna get our, I'm gonna take the left-hand side, the left-hand side now contracted with GCD. So this left-hand side gets down to here, we divide both sides by two, contract both sides with GCD. And we have that the coefficients now, when we just realize that when you contract, remember, when you contract a tensor with a metric, or contract any multi-component object with a metric, that's called raising, and in the abstract index notation, that's just uh, represented by putting the index up. And now we're done. There is no choice Well, there's a unique choice of derivative operator. So if you have one derivative operator, then it's uniquely determined by the metric. B determines delta A. So from now on, right, we're gonna assume pretty much for the rest of this course that we have a metric that we're, we're associated to the manifold. Well, let me put it this way. From now on, when we have a metric, right, 
then I will uh, implicitly assume that delta A, B is this operator. Now in the specific choice, where delta A twiddle is the coordinate derivative with respect to a chart, the following Christoffel symbols well they're given by the theorem, right? So the coefficient C here are completely determined in the theorem. We have delta A twiddle, then just substituting in for delta A twiddle in the coordinate chart gives us the following equation. Well, firstly, let's just substitute for delta A twiddle. And then in the coordinate chart, determining the derivative operator delta A, these symbols uh, have the following representation. So remember that in a coordinate chart, the derivative, coordinate derivative of a tensor has these components. So for that, exp I have a ex slightly expanded explanation of the action of the coordinate derivative in a coordinate base on my blog, you can see an additional note there that I added after the previous lecture, the lecture notes for the previous lecture. So these Christoffel symbols for the coordinate derivative with respect to a chart psi uh, are given uniquely in terms of the metric. Now, this has all been rather abstract so far. I'm gonna now explain how in terms of, uh, I'm going to apply this in terms of a very, very simple example, but this will already, this example, I think will already very clearly illustrate um, all the, the factors, um, all these objects at play. So we're going to focus on pretty much the simplest manifold that we have at our disposal, namely uh, the two dimensional plane Euclidean space. And you're going to see how the derivative operator is, is uniquely determined. So choose a chart, psi, furnishing the usual Cartesian products, uh, Cartesian coordinate system. with coordinates x, y, right? So this is just you know, ordinary two-dimensional x, y coordinates. And we, we're, in the uh, we're in a coordinate chart where uh, the coordinate chart is covers the whole manifold, m, and uh, the coordinates are written x, y. So we're gonna let v be a vector in this coordinate system. So V equals the sum as mu goes over X or Y, V superscript mu, and then we need the, the basis vectors in this coordinate system, which are these partial derivative operators at the point P. So there's V. Now we choose delta A twiddle with respect to these Cartesian coordinates. Now we'll see that we have really no choice in the in derivative operators in different coordinate systems. 
So let's first of all work out parallel transport in this coordinate system. Well, to do that, we have to work out the parallel. We have to work out how delta a twiddle acts on a vector. So at the point P, which has coordinates x, y, how is delta a twiddle v defined? Well, it's the coordinate derivative with respect to this coordinate system. So it's just d dx, d dx nu of v mu, all at x, y. And demanding that a uh, this vector is parallel transported in this coordinate system according to that this derivative operator leads to the following condition on the components v mu namely that they're constant so if v is a tangent vector at p the parallel transported vector at Q, which we could denote uh, U gamma VP, we could just denote that as BQ twiddle. So this is the parallel transported vector. According to this equation, this parallel transport equation here, uh, what components does V twiddle Q have? So at the new point, x prime, y prime, which is just the, in this coordinate chart, psi, the image of psi, uh, of q under psi. So the, the new components of this vector at the new point y after parallel transport is just the same as the components at the original coordinate. So this is the point p, this is the point q, um, and then that's the, cu the, the curve gamma connecting P and Q. And then here's imposing the parallel transport condition on this derivative operator leads to this notion of parallel transport where you just slide the vector around. This is the usual notion of parallel transport in flat space. Now, if we do all of this again in a different coordinate system, we see that we have no choice uh, in, in the derivative operator. You know, in the new coordinate system, in any new coordinate system, the derivative operator is now completely determined. So let's now go to another chart. So, you know, you've got an infinite number of coordinate charts in. In, in any manifold, but let's just choose one that you're probably very familiar with, and that is uh, polar coordinates. And let's see how, I'm now gonna slowly derive uh, all of the ingredients of the derivative operator in this new coordinate chart, and we'll see that although a priori you could write down an infinite number of um, derivative operators is really one that's uniquely determined by the metric. So I should have said that the, I didn't write this out actually. What I should have said up here is that in this coordinate, the Cartesian coordinate system, the Christoffel symbols uh, all vanish. So you know, I'll just put that in here as a little exercise, you'll see it's not such a hard exercise. So, so we have uh, a coordinate system. What does the metric, I didn't write out the metric, right? So the metric in this coordinate system is dx mu dx tensor dx mu, or otherwise known as dx squared tensor dx. plus dy tensor dy. And you can prove as an exercise that 
the Christopher symbols in this coordinate system vanish. So let's now do all of these calculations again, but with respect to polar coordinates. So, so in polar coordinates, how are they defined? Well, something with Cartesian coordinates x and y has polar coordinates r cos phi, r sine phi. Now we want to, uh, we now need to transform the metric. You know, what does the metric look like in a new coordinate system? How do we determine length in polar coordinates? That's the other way of saying it. Well, remember that G in the old coordinate system is dx tends to dx. Well, you know, I think I wrote something teeny bit wrong. No, 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 that's correct. Um, so the metric in the old coordinate system is dx tends to dx plus dy tends to dy. Now we're going to go to the new coordinate system. So to do that, we have to note that uh, dx is the same as partial dx dr, big uh, dr, d d phi, d phi. And similarly, uh, dy is dx dr plus, oops, sorry, dy is dy dr dr plus dy d phi d phi right that's just what it means the differential of the coordinates x and y we can substitute those two expressions into this into the metric here and then in the new coordinate system with respect to the new uh, differentials dr and d phi we get the following expression for the metric we get a little exercise um, just for you to expand everything out we get dr tensor dr plus r squared d phi tensor d phi so a little increment in phi leads to a bigger change in the length um, if the further you are away from the origin so that that should be i hope intuitively clear from polar coordinates if you've got a point on the, the plane and you rotate, then by an angle phi or d phi, a little angle d phi, then you create a bigger displacement the further away you are from the origin. So that's why the metric has this different form in this new coordinate system. And so this def that's the metric in the new coordinate system. And I... My, I should comment here that the components of the metric in this new coordinate system, GRR is 1, G phi R equals G R phi equals 0, and G phi phi has the components R squared. Now we've got the metric in our new coordinate system. We could have chosen another coordinate system, but we're doing things in polar coordinates. Now let's calculate the Christoffel symbols. So we have this formula for, for the Christoffel symbols. Uh, and that's in terms of the metric and it's inverse. So we need to work out the inverse of the metric. So uh, I've written G, uh, I should have G prime R, right? And G prime. So G prime now, we can take the metric and represent it as a matrix, right? Remember any two, uh, two index tensor can be represented as a matrix and we'll do exactly that. Uh, and th that matrix has the following components, one, zero, zero, R squared. And we can form the inverse of this matrix. And the inverse of this matrix is 1, 0, 0, 1 over R squared. Right? If you take this 2 by 2 matrix and multiply it by the other one, you get the, the identity matrix. And now we can actually start calculating these Christoffel symbols in this new coordinate system. So we've got the gamma RRR. I claim that that's 0. So uh, whenever I don't have the equation for the Christoffel symbol, you have to go ahead and uh, Check that these equations yourself, gamma r r phi equals zero, gamma phi r r is zero, but what about gamma phi r phi? What's that equal to? Well, this turns out to be the, a non-trivial Christoffel symbol. So let's work it out. So according to 
the equation we have for the Christoffel symbols in terms of the metric. This is up here somewhere. Here they are. So we're going to now apply this formula here for the Christoffel symbols. And maybe we call this triple star. You see that I got this sum over sigma here, but because the metric's diagonal, that, that sum over sigma is, is gonna vanish. We just have uh, one term. So, so we apply triple star here. And we just substitute for all these coordinates and the corresponding components of the metric. So we've got DDR G phi phi plus DD phi uh, gr phi minus dg r phi d phi. Okay, so I've just applied the formula triple star for the uh, Christoffel symbols. Now, if you look at the metric, the metric is zero anyway. It has off diagonal component zero, so they're gone. But look at this first term, that's actually not zero. So g phi phi is equal to r squared. So if you, and the inverse of g evaluated, let's see, g prime, sorry, it should have been primes here. And the inverse of g prime, the phi phi component is one over r squared. So substituting all this in, gives us one over R for that Christoffel symbol. So this is a non-trivial Christoffel symbol in this, this coordinate basis. And so similarly, right, we have that gamma phi R, R is zero, gamma R phi phi is minus R. You can go ahead and work that out yourself. So this is, exercise stuff. You've, see, you've seen me do the equation, uh, uh, the derivation for one of the Christoffel symbols is exactly the same computation every time. And so here's the remaining uh, Christoffel symbol. So there's eight in total, right? There's two, two times two times two Christoffel symbols. So now let's actually do a computation of parallel transport in this new co uh, coordinate chart. So we could parallel transport in any way in, in that we that we could imagine in any along any curve, but let's just keep life simple. So imagine we have a vector at the point P with some radial coordinate R and some angular coordinate phi. And imagine we're going to parallel transport along the radial direction. So We want to parallel transport our vector V along the curve, this green curve C, and this green curve C is just um, displace along the radial direction. So that's our curve. So we know what is the tangent vector to this curve. So T um, is the DDR, right? It's just you know, displace, it's the, tang it's the curve whose tangent vector is points in the radial direction. And remember, tangent vectors are identified with partial derivative operators, DDR, at the point P, or in fact, at any, long, at any point on the curve, it's DDR. So that's, that's our goal. We want to parallel transport this vector V along the curve C, which goes in the radial direction. So T is D, D, R, which means that, you know, in components, T mu, D, D, X prime, mu prime, mu prime, 
Uh, that implies that T of the T phi component is equal to zero and the TR component is equal to one. Now we write out the parallel transport equation. So that's D V R And the parallel transport condition, right? Remember, it says TA delta A VB equals zero. Now in components, in the coordinate system we have chosen, that is equal to a little exercise, right? DVR, the, the rth component of our tangent vector has to transform as such. VR plus gamma R phi, V phi equals zero. And that's one, you, you know, there's two parts to this. There's two components, two equations. The phi component of the L tangent vector has to transform such. Now, if you look at these two equations, right, we can now substitute in for the Christoffel symbols. Um, and I did that in the second equation already. So we know that, that gamma RR gamma r r r is zero so that's that's zero there and gamma r r phi should also be zero if i remember correctly yep so we have that now our parallel transport conditions for the vector v and its components for the components of the vector v so these parallel transport conditions are that d v d r the radial component of a tangent vector as you parallel transport it doesn't change, right? So as you, if you go back to this picture here, if you have a, ve a vector V and it, there's a radial component and as you slide it along the curve in the radial direction, that radial component doesn't grow or get, it doesn't get bigger or get smaller. But if you have a, a phi component, then you have to solve a little differential equation uh, to work out how a, the phi component of the vector V should transform. Let's, so we have to solve this differential equation here. So that is the same as solving one over V phi dV phi has got to equal minus one over R dr. So we'll just integrate this so we get uh, log of v phi equals minus log of uh, r plus some constant and then uh, exponentiating both sides we learn that v phi depends on um, equals one it depends inversely with r times by some constant a Yeah, let's just call it A. A is a constant that's determined by initial conditions. So we learn that as you parallel transport a vector along a radial uh, curve in polar coordinates, uh, you better be rescaling that that. Uh, phi component as you go along the, the, the radial component. And that makes some sense, right? Because if you didn't rescale it, then because the, the, the basis vector that points in the direction phi is effectively larger and larger as you go along the curve, uh, the vector, the tangential component in the phi direction would be getting larger and larger as you parallel transport. But that not, does not accord with our notion of parallel transport. So that's why we have to rescale this component of the vector v phi in polar coordinates. Now that's a little, this is a very simple, this is almost the simplest possible example of working with derivative operators, metrics, and um, uh, connections and uh, Christoffel symbols. And it, but hopefully it should illustrate to you why there's no choice in the, uh, in our derivative operator. So once you, you choose a coordinate basis, 
and the derivative operator, uh, the derivative operator is determined by the Christoffel symbols in, with respect to that coordinate chart. Now, uh, I want to spend a little bit of time discussing the tensorial or lack of tensorial nature of the Christoffel symbols. Um, there has been some additional discussion in the comments of the previous video on the tensorial or lack of tensorial character of the coefficients C, A, B, C. And um, I do encourage you to read those, those comments and also uh, to take a look uh, at the, uh, the note I gave uh, on my blog on, on the definition of the coordinate derivative, hopefully that helps. Uh, but I want to explain what, what uh, how these Christoffel symbols change when you change coordinate charts. So we'll just take a little digression now to explain how these Christoffel symbols transform as you change coordinate systems. So suppose delta x is an affine connection What we're going to do is understand how these Christoffel symbols arise in a tensorial uh, setting. So what we're going to do is let omega be a tensor of type 0, 1. So we've called such things also, we've called them 1 forms. So the object delta x omega is, per definition, a tensor of type 0, 1. Zero 2, right. So let psi be a chart for a coordinate system. And what we're going to do is now choose, well, we're going to write out our, our ingredients here in terms of the, the coordinate basis. So the vector field x is written as ddx mu Uh, at the point P and the one form we're going to choose in coordinates the one form to have the representation dx nu. So this is a specific choice for the vector x and a specific choice for the one form omega. I'm just going to take a moment to confirm an equation here. Sorry. The object delta x omega is a, still a one form, right? The, the, once you hand, so it's very important to note that a derivative operator is a device which takes a vector and then transforms the object or differentiates the object in the direction of that vector and produces another instance of that object. So sorry, I wrote t02 before. That would have been correct had I left this so with an open uh, index, but we don't have that. We have, in fact, we're making a specific choice for the vector uh, component there. So the, the derivative of a tensor is a tensor of type uh, KL plus one. But the moment you make a choice for this vector entry here, big X, then you, you get another instance of the tensor that you're differentiating. Now we're going to take this. So we know that once we've applied the derivative operator to a one form, we get another one form back and it transforms as a one form according to the tensor transformation law. And 
Uh, we're now just going to make a choice for uh, these two uh, elements here. We're going to make a choice for the, the vector x being one of the coordinate basis elements, and we're going to make a choice for this one form as one of the coordinate, the dual coordinate basis vectors. And if you substitute, make these this choice substituted into this expression here for the derivative operator, then you will see where the Christoffel symbols appear in this expression. So if you if you calculate out now uh, the derivative of a one basis one form with respect to a basis vector, and you substitute the these two uh, elements into the equation for the derivative of a tensor, then you'll find out that you'll get precisely this expression for the coefficients for, for, the, for this derivative. And this involves these Christoffel symbols here. Now this geometrically, for each choice of mu and nu, so for each choice, you know, this is a basis dependent choice now of mu nu, we get, uh, we get a one form or tensor of type zero one. Uh, so, you know, we've got a bunch of one forms indexed by mu and nu, and these have a name, these are called the connection one forms. Another way of thinking of this as is as a bunch of tensors of type 1, 1 indexed by a vector. We won't go into that. Um, I'll link a discussion in Stack Overflow if you're interested in that uh, perspective. Now we've seen how these connection coefficients, Christoffel symbols look like in one chart. And we've even done a calculation where we've looked at these Christoffel symbols in another chart, and we've seen that they're different, right? Uh, and that's uh, a very important observation. We learned that even though the Christoffel symbols might vanish in one chart, in another, they may be non-zero. So that implies that the Christoffel symbols themselves don't transform as a tensor of type one, two. But how do they transform? Well, that's the task now. So let's suppose our derivative operator is the coordinate derivative with respect for a chart uh, u psi, u is just the open set containing the point p that we're interested in. And then we're going to consider another chart that v psi prime be another chart. Such that, right, we can't just choose any old chart. It has to at least have some intersection with our original chart, otherwise nothing further what I say will make sense. And the coordinates, we're going to write the coordinates of our chart V as Y instead of X. And now let's take a look at the Christoffel symbols and the, uh, and the way they determine the derivative operator in these two charts. So let's look at the derivative of a vector t. Yeah, so t I've been using before as a curve. Um, bah, bah, bah. Let's just say v. Yeah. This is just the ordinary covariant derivative with respect to in general, of a vector v. Now, how do we connect this with the, the Christoffel symbols that we have in a given basis? Well, we know this connection, right? You can always, this is just the dual version of what I wrote above. You know that if you choose 
a coordinate basis ddx alpha and then take the covariant derivative of another coordinate basis element ddx beta that that actually uh, involves the Christoffel symbols on the left hand side here. So this is just setting up the data of parallel transport in the coordinate system determined by psi. But now let's go to Now we're going to write this all out in the coordinate system psi prime. Well, we need to work out uh, how our uh, derivative operator basis, our tangent vector basis transforms under this change of coordinates. So we're going to define the following basis. vector for the tangent space in our new coordinate system, ddx alpha. But how does that look in terms of our old basis? Well, we just have to change the coordinate system. That's how it looks in the old basis. So it's a linear combination of those tangent vectors. And then we also define the Christoffel symbols with respect to this new basis. I said set before, but I think I prefer the, the, the terminology to note. You just note that the Christoffel symbols uh, can be obtained by computing the covariant derivative of a basis element with respect to another basis element. So now we define the Christoffel symbols with respect to our new basis analogously. We'll call them gamma twiddle alpha beta ddy beta so, or define or rather note yeah because it's just this is the notation we're, we're setting up so the Christoffel symbols with respect to the new basis are defined by computing the covariant derivative of a tangent basis vector with respect to another tangent space vector tangent basis vector but now we've got We've got two things at play now. We've got the, uh, the Christoffel symbols defined with respect to one coordinate basis, and we want to see, and we've got uh, the coordinate basis in the new coordinate system. But let's try and express everything. I mean, in principle, we should be able to express y, ddy back in terms of our old basis. And therefore, perhaps we should be able to extract out an equation that relates delta a, the Christoffel symbols in the new basis, to the Christoffel symbols in the older basis. So let's substitute now this expression into the definition of the Christoffel symbols in our new basis. I'm going to substitute that into here, and we're going to substitute that into there. And then we have a slightly lengthy calculation to do. So we get d squared mu dy alpha dy beta d dx mu plus d dx lambda dy alpha dx mu dy beta and then oops d dx lambda d dx mu so all we've done here is substitute this expression here in the brackets into uh, both places where the coordinate basis tangent vector ddy stood. Now writing, expanding out all these derivatives and relabeling the indices gives us the following expression.
And we know that that's This actually tells us an equation that relates the Christoffel symbols in the new basis to the Christoffel symbols in the old basis. So the, the gamma alpha beta gamma twiddles have to be related to the Christoffel symbols in the original basis according to this formula. Otherwise, nothing, this equation wouldn't work, right? So we've actually determined the transformation law by comparing these two definitions of Christoffel symbols as covariant derivatives of tangent basis vectors, we've determined the transformation law of the Christoffel symbols and we see something very interesting. So in particular, we see that the Christoffel symbols don't transform as a tensor, but as something a bit different. So the first term is, is the tensorial transformation law, but there's this additional term that comes that depends on the second derivatives of the coordinates with respect to the new coordinates, the old coordinates with respect to the new coordinates. And that's responsible for this inhomogeneous part of the Christoffel symbols in the polar coordinates. And it's worth noting that when uh, gamma transforms in this way, we are ensuring that gamma x y is a vector. Uh, and that, that I'll leave as an exercise for you, where x in one coordinate system and y is given it so in one coordinate system um, versus x twiddle in a new coordinate system. Oops, that should be y, of course. So by having these, the, the fact that the Christoffel symbols transform in this particular inhomogeneous way ensures that the covariant derivative of one vector with respect to another uh, is independent of coordinate system chosen. So that's a, I mean, it's not such a, a challenging exercise, but it's very, very revealing. So the exercise is show that delta x, y computed with respect to uh, the original coordinate system is actually equal to x twiddle alpha d dy alpha x, oops, y, y twiddle beta d dy beta. So you've got to show that those two ways of calculating things give exactly the same answers. And that's your exercise. You know, you substitute in the definition in the left, you substitute in the right, sum over some repeated indices, get some matrices and inverses, and then you'll convince yourself that delta x, y in one coordinate system behaves exactly as this transforms in exactly the right way so that in the new coordinate system you get the same vector. Okay, so that's to briefly summarize in, in this part of the, the lecture I've been focusing on the geometrical nature of the affine connection and the covariant derivative. I pointed out that the Christoffel symbols are embedded in various formulae for uh, the covariant derivative. In particular, if you take the covariant derivative of a basis dual vector or a basis tangent vector, the Christoffel symbols appear uh, in the definitions of these covariant derivatives. And, and furthermore, 
that if you transform to a different coordinate system, the Christoffel symbols transform in precisely the right way so that these geometrical objects remain vectors. So for the final topic today, I want to talk about a, a particular class of curves on manifolds that will play an extraordinarily important role in general relativity, namely geodesics. So let M G A B be a manifold with metric. And hence implicitly we have a derivative operator determined. So we're going to have, uh, we're going to introduce a, a special class of curves on so this manifold. And these curves are called geodesics. And what are they? Well, they are in, intuitively A geodesic is the straightest possible curve you can draw on M. It's the straightest possible, straightest possible curve you can trace through M. Now it's, I'll give you the motivation of this, in, of this concept in terms of embedded manifolds, and then hopefully that'll motivate the definition that we have, the intrinsic definition that we come up presently with, hopefully we'll be motivated by this. So suppose you have a manifold M, you know, I'm taking here the surface of the sphere embedded into three space. Now it's kind of clear that the, some curves are straighter than other curves, right? So let's take a look at this curve here in red. It connects the points P and Q. So it wiggles all around the sphere, the surface of the sphere, but it gets to, to Q eventually. Starts at P, ends at Q. So the red curve is a curve on, on M, but somehow it's not the straightest curve, right? There exists a curve that is straighter that goes between P and Q, namely, just go around the great circle. So there exists a straighter curve that we can draw between P and Q, namely a great circle. And the thing to note about this straighter curve is that it has a shorter length, right? You, you can sort of imagine adding up the length of these two curves. But there's another important feature of this straighter curve that may be not apparent at first sight but it is the notion that we make that we can make intrinsic. Namely, a geodesic, or this straightest curve green, is a curve whose tangent vector is actually parallel transported along the curve itself. So you can look at the, the great circle and you imagine parallel transporting its the tangent vector itself along itself, so the tangent vector of a great circle sort of points along the great circle, and you see that, yeah, indeed, the tangent vector of the curve is parallel transported along itself. And the red curve does not have that feature. But the beautiful thing is now, we have an intrinsic notion of tangent vector, we have an intrinsic notion of of parallel transported. So we actually have an intrinsic notion of a geodesic, the shortest curve on, on a manifold. So a geodesic is a curve satisfying the following condition, namely TA delta A TB equals zero. So now let's choose a coordinate system and look at that expression in terms of our, in terms of a specific coordinate system psi. So the geodesic itself in a coordinate system of a manifold uh, is is a curve, and a curve has coordinates x mu 
and they depend on some parameter t, lowercase t, and we're in a coordinate chart, so it's in Rn. So according to star, right, this notion of parallel transport that we have earlier in today's lecture, we have that the components of our tangent vector in this coordinate system have to obey this condition, the parallel transport condition. But now, in place of v, we're putting the tangent vector itself. Now, since these components are nothing other than dx mu dt, we have in this coordinate system the so-called geodesic equation, which is a second order set of nonlinear ordinary differential equations. coupled set of nonlinear ordinary differential equations, but now of second order with respect to the parameter t specifying the point along the curve. It's a system of n ordinary differential equations of second order. And this is all with respect to a coordinate uh, basis. So as soon as you have a metric, to summarize the content of today's lecture, as soon as you have a metric, you determine a unique derivative operator for a manifold. And with respect to this uniquely determined derivative operator, we can define the notion of parallel transport of a vector. And finally, applying that notion of parallel transport to the tangent vector to a curve itself, we introduce the notion of a geodesic as the shortest possible curve that connects two points on a manifold M, as a candidate, I should say, for the notion of the shortest possible curve connecting two points on a manifold M. As we'll see in coming lectures, geodesics play a very, uh, they play a special role in general relativity, a central role, um, as they uh, realize uh, freely falling uh, observers in general relativity. So we're going to say that an observer is freely falling if it moves on a geodesic on the manifold determined by space-time itself. And as we'll see, that plays a ex very important role in, in, in obtaining Einstein's field equations and also in determining the dynamics of freely falling observers. That will be a topic for the coming lectures, but for today, that's it. Thank you very much and see you next time.